control of insect, mite pests and diseases is essential for successful home gardening and part of general management practices for your vegetable garden. Plant symptoms might reflect disease injury from fungi, bacteria, nematodes or viruses, insect or mite injury, chemical or herbicide injury, or physical or environmental damage caused by growing conditions, location, or soil fertility deficiencies or excesses. Some of the good gardening practices include conduct soil tests and follow the recommendation to supply appropriate nutrients as needed. Adding extra fertilizer won't create healthy soil because excess nitrogen or phosphorus can promote insects and disease problems and can lead to runoff issues. Add organic matter to the soil each year in the form of soil amendments or mulch. Nursery and garter catalogs often identify such varieties. Start with quality seeds and healthy plants. Purchase stocky dark green transplants and buy certified virus-free seed potatoes. Remove the weeds and grass from the growing site because they compete for nutrients and water. Rapidly growing vegetables can better tolerate or outgrow insect, mite and disease damage, but they also quickly use up available nutrients. Apply fertilizer and water at critical times during maximum plant growth is essential for producing pest and disease resistant plants. Remove infected plants during the season to prevent spread within the garden. And remove plant debris after harvest to avoid harboring insects, mites and diseases. Dispose of or burn diseased plants, fruits and vegetables. Composting is seldom, thorough enough to eliminate disease causing fungi and bacteria. Planting the same crop in the same place year after year creates losses due to soil-borne diseases and overwriting insect pests. Follow a crop rotation of at least three years for the four major vegetable plant families. Solanum, tomato, potato, pepper and eggplant, cucurbit, melons, squash and cucumbers, cruciferous, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage and Brussels sprouts, and allium, onion, garlic and leeks. 8 to 10 hours of direct sunlight a day are necessary for proper growth, flowering and footing of most vegetable crops. Sunlight also helps to dry foliage and reduce infection by many fungal and bacterial diseases. Plants receiving either too much or not enough water will be less vigorous and more susceptible to insect and mite pests and diseases. Consider using a form of drip irrigation which will keep foliage dry and prevent foliar diseases while at the same time using water more efficiently. If using a hose, direct the water towards the ground and avoid wetting the foliage. Mulch helps control weeds and reduces moisture evaporation from the soil surface. Mulch also helps prevent rot caused when fruit is in contact with bare soil. When tilled under, organic mulches become valuable soil amendments. Overcrowding plants can result in weak growth and an increase in foliar diseases. Stake, cages, trellises and pruning all help to increase air circulation. Seeds planted too early are more susceptible to rot. Delay planting until the soil has warmed to 
allow rapid germination of seeds and growth of young plants. Learn their life cycle, their habits and stages they are most easily controlled. Refrain from using any pesticide until you have correctly identified a given pest and determined the proper time for control. Plants that have few insect, mite and disease problems include loose leaf lettuce, rhubarb, Swiss chard, garlic, cos lettuce, leeks, parsley, sweet potatoes, okra, beets, snap peas, parsnips, carrots, onions and kale. Birds are predators of insects. For instance, more than a dozen species of birds are known to feed on various moth larvae. Check the undersides of plant's leaves. Detect symptoms when they first develop, so that pest problems can be more easily controlled. Accept the fact that there might be some damage from pests and even an occasional crop failure. Thank you for watching and please subscribe to see similar videos and learn more good gardening practices. Artichoke is both a nutritious vegetable and a beautiful landscape plant. Plants can reach 3 feet in height and the flower, if allowed to bloom, can be 7 inches in diameter. Artichoke produces best in deep, fertile, well-drained soil, but will grow in a wide range of soils. The plant's deep roots need relatively deep soils with adequate volume for root development. Sandy soils with excessive drainage should be avoided. Although artichokes are moderately salt-tolerant, soil with a high salt content will reduce their growth and yield. Artichoke has several varieties, including Green Club, Imperial Star, Harmony, Madrigal, Emerald, Grand Burr, Talp Piot, Purple Sicilian. Start seeds before fall planting because it can take up to 60 days before plants are of suitable size for planting. Artichoke is transplanted in mid-October, which means seeds must be started in mid-August. Seeds can be easily started in a greenhouse, in a shady spot outside in late summer, or indoors under a grow light. Plant the seeds 1 4th inch deep in potting mix when the temperature doesn't exceed 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Water seeds regularly and shade them from the hot afternoon sun.
artichokes grow well when fertilized regularly. It is best to have your soil tested and amend the soil according to the test results and recommendations. If a soil test is not done, follow the general recommendations. If manure is available, mix 100 to 140 pounds of compost manure per 100 square feet into the soil before planting. Phosphorus and potash are best applied before planting and should also be worked in. Artichokes require about 0.1 pound of nitrogen per 100 square feet. Work it into the soil before planting and apply an additional 0.3 pound per 100 square feet 6 to 8 weeks later. Foliar applications of a liquid fertilizer containing calcium and zinc are recommended every two weeks during active growth in early spring. Transplant seedlings 2.5 to 3 feet apart in rows 3 to 4 feet apart. Transplants grow slowly in the fall and winter, October through January, but in early spring, artichoke plants will rapidly increase in size. Artichoke should be planted in a well-drained soil and mulch well to help reduce weeds and conserve soil moisture. Do not expose artichokes to temperatures below 25 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter. If there is a threat of frost, cover plants with a 6-inch layer of straw mulch, leaves, a bucket or frost blanket, or some other form of frost protection. A hot, dry climate causes artichoke buds to open quickly and destroys the tenderness of the edible parts. In the summer, irrigation will help keep temperatures down in the crop canopy to prevent bud opening. Artichokes are deep-rooted and require adequate moisture when growing and producing fruit. Moisture stress might result in black tip, which is only a surface damage because the edible portion of the bud is not affected. Black tip is most common when conditions are sunny, warm and windy. Leave plenty of space between plants to reduce the chance of a disease becoming a problem. Artichokes are susceptible to root rot, so do not let the soil become too wet. Mulching artichokes will reduce weeds and conserve soil moisture. It is important to remove weeds when artichokes are small, because the plants are most susceptible to weed competition at this stage. Large, fully developed artichoke plants compete well with weeds. A healthy plant should produce 6 to 9 buds per plant. The main harvest usually occurs in April and May. Select buds for their size, compactness and age. All buds of suitable size should be harvested by cutting the stem 2 to 3 inches below the base of the bud. 
old stems should be removed as soon as all buds have been harvested to allow new stems to grow. Artichoke is a perennial plant, so once the harvest is done in June, cut the plant back to soil level. This will put the plant crown into a dormant stage during the summer. The plant will send out shoots in the fall. The new shoots can be dug out to be replanted into a new location in the garden or left in a place to produce another year. Make sure you leave only the most vigorous shoot on the old plant for production next spring. Thank you for watching and for more please check the playlist on how to grow vegetables and subscribe to be notified on the upcoming videos. the plant farm it youtube channel an asparagus plant can last 15 years choose its spot in the garden carefully you can start asparagus from seed or from one year old roots called crowns crowns grow vertically and horizontally planting at the right depth is important good soil moisture is important at planting for good root and fan growth begin harvest two years after planting crowns three years after planting seeds Harvest spears until the end of June, and then allow the large feeder ferns to develop. To find out more about how to grow asparagus, watch the video until the end, and make sure to subscribe, and click on the bell button to be notified on the similar upcoming videos on sustainable gardening practices. Asparagus is one of the earliest harvested vegetables each spring. Asparagus spears are crisp, tender and flavorful. The asparagus harvest season lasts about 6 to 8 weeks, from early May to late June. In the peak of asparagus season, asparagus spears can grow up to 2 inches per day, producing bountiful harvests for gardeners to enjoy. Asparagus is a unique crop. It is one of the few perennial vegetables. The edible parts of the plant are called the spears. The spears emerge from the underground buds at the base of the root system. These buds and roots are called crumbs. If spears are left to grow, they develop leaves and are called ferns. Asparagus harvest is only two months instead of the entire season because the plants need the chance to let the ferns grow in order to recover and build up energy for the next year. The fern creates energy that will be stored in the underground portion of the plant to produce the following year's spears. It is important to take care of the ferns even after the harvest is over to make sure you will have good future harvests. Asparagus grows best in well-trained soils, with a pH between 6.5 to 7, and does not tolerate extremely acidic soils. It can grow in heavy, medium or sandy soils, as long as the soils must be well-trained and do not exhibit cooling water after rains. Before planting asparagus, have your soil tested to see if the soil has the right amount 
of nutrients for asparagus to thrive. Add recommended fertilizer based on the soil test results. It is best to add part of fertilizer the fall or spring before planting, but about half of the phosphorus and potassium should be added at the time of planting. Nitrogen should be added after planting, once the crowns begin growing. In the absence of a soil test report, the typical garden fertilizer rate for asparagus is to apply 1 to 1.5 1 pounds of a 10% nitrogen, 10% phosphorus and 10% potassium fertilizer per 100 square feet before planting. Once an asparagus patch is established, it is best to test the soil approximately every three years and follow the test recommendations before adding nutrients. After the asparagus patch is established, fertilizer, compost or compost manure can be added either in the early spring before spear emergence or after harvest in the late June or early July. Only add these inputs if they are needed according to the soil test. Add the fertilizer alongside the row of plants and scratch it in lightly. Do not allow the tool to penetrate the soil more than an inch deep to avoid harming the underground portions of the plants. There are female and male plants. I'll produce edible spears. Only plants with all female flowers produce red, inedible berries in summer. Female plants grow larger spears. Male plants grow a greater number of smaller, uniform spears. Most hybrids are plants with only male flowers that produce no seeds. Plants with all male flowers do not use energy or developing seeds and fruits. Male asparagus plants tend to live longer and produce more spears. Female plants can produce undesirable weedy, seedling asparagus plants. A planting of asparagus can last 15 years or more, so choose the spot for an asparagus bed carefully. Choose a fertile, sunny, well-drained site with soil that holds moisture well. Late spring frost can kill emerged spears, so find an area that is not exposed to frost. Asparagus plants have deep root systems, avoid areas with shallow soils or soils prone to water saturation. If the asparagus bed is to be part of a larger vegetable garden, the best place is at the north end of the garden, so that the tall ferns do not shade the other crops. Asparagus is planted between early May and early June. Refrigerate the crowns until planting. Dip a 6 to 12 inch deep trench for the crowns to be planted into. In heavy clay soils, make the furrows more shallow, 6 to 8 inches, and deeper, 10 to 12 inches, for very sandy soil. As the soil is removed from the trench, set it directly to the side. It will be returned to the trench several weeks later as the ferns grow. The length of the trench should be as long as the number of crowns being planted. For example, if you have 10 crowns, dig a 10 foot long branch. If planting multiple rows, space the furrows at least 3 feet apart because the plants will spread as they age. Choose an area of the garden as a nursery bed. Young asparagus plants will grow here for their first year. The site for the asparagus nursery should be level and have sandy soil. Plants sit in spring, about 1 inch deep, spaced 2-3 inches apart, with rows that are foot apart. Seeds can take 3 weeks to germinate. Keep the nursery bed free from weeds, as the asparagus seedlings will not be able to compete with strong wheat growth. Mulch the nursery bed with 4 to 6 inches of straw in late October to keep it warm during the winter. In early April, before the plants start to grow, dig up the crowns with as much of the root system as you can and move them to their permanent location. Soil 
moisture is important for good root and fan growth in asparagus. Even though asparagus fans rarely exhibit obvious signs of drought stress, they need consistent soil moisture in order to stay healthy for the next year. Watering during the harvest season might also increase yields in very dry years. Asparagus patches should receive at least one inch of water every week. Asparagus growing in sandy soil should be watered more than once per week. In the absence of rain and heavy clay soils might not need to be watered as often. Additionally, soil covered in mulch will retain more water. An inch of water will wet the sandy soil to a depth of 10 inches and wet a heavy soil clay to a 6 inches. Weeds compete with asparagus for soil nutrients, water, and light, so managing weeds will help support a more bountiful yield of spears. Removing weeds by a hand is still one of the most effective methods, especially in smaller asparagus beds. Additional methods include well-timed hoeing, flame feeding, cover crops, and careful use of selected herbicides. In spring, spears will start to emerge from the soil. The first spring, a year after planting the crowns, do not harvest any spears. Allow the spears to become ferns and build the strength of the crowns. The second spring, after planting crowns, if the plants were strong and healthy during the previous growing season, begin to harvest when the spears are 6 to 8 inches long. In the first year of harvest, only pick asparagus for two weeks. After that, allow the spears to develop into ferns. In the following years, harvest asparagus up to July. Some gardeners will not harvest during the second year at all, preferring to allow the plants to build more strength before finally beginning to harvest in the third year. Fresh asparagus is such a springtime treat that you can eat within hours of picking, but it can also be kept for up to a week in the refrigerator. You can freeze an asparagus harvest. You should only can asparagus in a pressure canner. Thank you for watching and make sure to subscribe and click on the bell button to be notified on the similar upcoming videos. Plant, Farm, Eat It's a platform for healthy culture and environmental enthusiasts, helping you maximize your time and efforts and provide you with pragmatic guides and practices how to plant, farm and eat sustainably. Welcome to the Plant Farm Eat YouTube channel. Cucumbers grow best in warm weather. Start seeds indoors in late April for transplants. Sow seeds directly in the garden after soil has warmed, usually in May. Plastic mulch and rock covers allow earlier planting. Please subscribe and click on the bell button to be notified on the upcoming videos. Cucumbers are common garden vegetables. You can eat them pickled or raw in salads, like other vine crops, such as squash, melons, and pumpkins. Cucumbers grow best in warm weather. Some varieties form long vines that might need to trellis. Others are bush types that fit better in a small garden. Have your soil tested. For best yield and quality, the soil pH should be between 6 and 6.5. 
which is slightly acidic. The soil should be moisture, retentive yet well drained. Forming raised beds will ensure good drainage, which this crops need. Improve your soil by adding well rotted manure or compost in spring or fall. Do not use fresh manure, as it might contain harmful bacteria and might increase weed problems. Do not use wheat and feed type fertilizers on vegetables. They contain weed killers that will kill vegetable plants. Cucumber plants have separate male and female flowers on the same plant. Male flowers usually appear first, each attached to the plant by a slender pedicel or stem. Female flowers grow close to the main vine. Between the flower and the vine is a small round ovary, the unifertilized fruit. An insect must move the pollen from the male flowers to the female flowers. Bees are common cucumber pollinators. Some newer varieties of cucumber will set fruit that develops normally, even if there is no pollination of the female flowers. These fruits will be seedless or nearly so. Other varieties have only female flowers, each of which can produce a fruit. These varieties can have high yields. You must grow the all-female varieties with another cucumber variety, having traditional flowering habit to provide pollen. The best way to start cucumbers is direct seeding. Sow seeds in late May, once the soil is at least 70 degrees Fahrenheit at the 1 inch depth. Earlier planting is possible with the use of black plastic mulch, which raises soil temperatures. Cut holes in the mulch and plant the seeds. Sow seeds about 1.5 inch deep. For winding types, it will spread out in the garden. Sow seeds 2 inches apart. Allow about 2-3 feet of space on either side of the row for the vines to spread. A heel of 3-4 to four seeds, sown close together, is another way to plant cucumbers in the garden. Allow 5-6 to six feet between hills. You can plant bush types with very short vines in closely spaced rows or hills, with only 2-3 to three feet in between. After growth, thin seedlings to stand 8-12 to 12 inches apart. Cucumber seeds will not germinate in cold soil. Plants started indoors and set out into cold soil will also not grow very well. Start seeds indoors, no earlier than 4 weeks before the last frost date. Start the seeds in pit pots that you can plant directly into the soil. Before the plant begins to outgrow its container, transplant it carefully. Do not damage the cucumber top. Long top roots and branching surface roots help cucumber plants reach soil moisture even in dry weather. Wine crops are heavy water feeders, so you should constantly check soil moisture. Cucumbers need about 1 inch of water from rainfall or irrigation each week during the growing season. Always soak the soil thoroughly when watering. Water sandy soils more often, but with lower amounts applied at one time. Frequent shallow cultivation with a hoe or hand tool will kill weeds before they become a problem. Continue cultivating as long as you can do so, without injuring the plants, usually when the vines begin to spread between the rows. When cultivation is no longer possible, pull large weeds by hand. Pick cucumbers when they reach the size you prefer. 
harvest slicers or salad cucumbers at any size before they are over large with seeds and yellowish skins. If you leave very large cucumbers on the vine, plant yield will decline. Harvest often, but be careful not to disturb the vine, as they often send out new roots from joints in the vine. Disturbing the vine can break these roots. Do not pick fruit when the vines are wet because of the danger of spreading diseases. Thank you for watching and please subscribe and click on the bell button to be notified on the upcoming videos. Plant, farm, eat, it's a platform for horticulture and environmental enthusiasts, helping you maximize your time and efforts and provide you with pragmatic guides and practices how to plant, farm and eat sustainably. Vegetables are unique plants and differ in their origin, type, cultivating requirements and care. Asparagus is a reoccurring plant, may last for many years in the garden. Plant asparagus near the side or edge of the garden where it will not interfere with other crops. Asparagus can be planted in early spring or in the fall. Purchase fresh plant crowns from a local garden center or plant seeding transplants. For a good care, well-trained soil and full sun location are necessary. Soak the area well in very dry weather. Cut and destroy frozen spears. Fertilize in the early spring and control weeds with mulching or hoeing. Harvest after the first year and usually six to seven weeks in a mature planting. Broccoli has increased in popularity considerably in the recent years. Set plants in the garden in late March to early April, before the danger of frost has passed. Plant fall broccoli direct seed in early July or plants in early August. Take care with fertilizing at planting. Sprinkle additional fertilizer side dress along the row every 2-3 to three weeks as the crop develops and provide adequate water as the head starts to develop. Harvest the head before the flowers start to open or before yellow centers of the flowers start to show. Cabbage is hardy, easy to grow vegetable. Most varieties are green, but some produce a red hat. Set cabbage plants in late March to early April or in the early August for a fall planting. Direct seeding cabbage can be planted in early July. Take care with a starter fertilizer when setting out plants and side dress every two to three weeks during the growing season. Cultivate carefully to avoid damaging shallow roots and irrigation is critical when heads are small and enlarging. Harvest when the head is fully formed and dense. Carrots are a cool seasonal crop and an excellent source of vitamin A. The roots grow fast in loose or sandy soils. Plant in mid to late April before the last freeze. For fall carrots, plant seeds in late July to early August. Take care until carrots germinate. Avoid heavy watering that could form across through the soil surface. Weeds compete with young plants, so careful breeding is necessary. Water is required as roots are emerging. To harvest, dig or pull low roots when they are at the desired diameter. Most carrot varieties require two months from seeding to mature. Cucumbers are warm season crops. It can be grown in larger spaces and even in containers. For planting, cucumbers require warm conditions with no danger of frost. For best results, plant in early May. Using black plastic mulch to warm soil is the way for producing cucumber syrup. Cucumbers are fairly shallow rooted, which require caution at the initial cultivation. Application of fertilizers along the row when the vines are developed 
long will improve production. Avoid areas where strong winds might damage ones. For harvesting, select firm, dark colored cucumbers. Small cucumbers might be harvested for pickles at any stage. Eggplant requires warm weather to grow well. Planting is usually done through transplanting in early to mid May. Eggplant is sensitive to cold temperatures. It thrives in hot, dry conditions. However, frequent watering is beneficial. Regular inspection and insect control measures are usually necessary. When harvesting, select firm, fully sized fruit that have a slightly soft touch with the bright and glossy skin. Onions are used primarily for flavoring and are rich in vitamins and minerals, and are low in calories. Onions are grown from seeds, plants, or seeds. Onions grow well in cool or warm weather. Plant seeds in mid March or plants or seed in early April. A shallow, inefficient root system requires regular watering and fertilizing for best results, as well as weed control is essential to reduce competition. Onions are ready for harvest when the tops begin to weaken and naturally follow. Parsley is an easy to grow vegetable that is commonly used as a garnish. It can be easily grown in containers indoors for fresh use during the winter. Parsley is a cool weather crop that can be planted in mid-April or in early August. The plant is shallow, rooted and requires regular fertilization and watering for best results. When harvesting, clip or break off individual leaves when they are full sized. Peppers are generally classified as sweet or hot and are in different colors. Peppers are usually set as transplants in the garden in mid May. Peppers thrive in well drained fertile soil. Consistent watering is preferred to avoid blossom and broth. When harvesting, carefully pick or cut peppers from the plants. Use rubber gloves to harvest very hot peppers. Potatoes are one of the most important world food crops and are a staple for many large gardens. Mid-March is a traditional time to plant sprinkled potatoes, while early to mid-July is the time for fall harvest. To encourage large yields and to prevent sun burning, potatoes should be healed or bleached. Pulling loose soil along the row as the crop is growing. Potatoes like a fertile, well drained location with loose, friable soil. Potatoes need regular, consistent watering, and mulches can be useful in holding moisture near the plant. Early, new potatoes can be harvested as the plants are growing by gently removing some plants in the row. Pumpkin is used for pies, breads, cookies, soup, and roasted seeds. Also, it's a warm season crop used primarily for Halloween decoration. Pumpkins can be safely planted after all danger of frost is passed in early to mid May. However, most growers prefer to plant in early to mid June to ensure that pumpkins do not mature too early and are ready for harvest in early October. For white, shallow cultivation, to keep weeds from developing in areas where vines will spread. Water thoroughly as the fruit starts to develop. Pumpkins are ready for harvest when the skin is tough and hard and the stem no longer leaks when cut from the vine. Tomatoes are among the most popular vegetable crop. They are easy to grow, productive in small garden areas also, and used in a wide variety of ways. Plant tomatoes from early May to June, after all danger of frost is past. Tomatoes are usually grown from transplants. Choose a strong, healthy transplant that has a dark green color. Set the plant slightly deeper than the container and firm soil well around the root system. Water with the starter solution immediately after planting, and mulching is necessary for weeds control. Tomatoes will ripen off the plant when the fruit are full sized and starting to show a slight tinge of color. Early harvest encourages additional production. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for the upcoming second part of Grow Vegetables. And please subscribe to become part of the Plant Farm Eat community.
to the Plant Farm Eat YouTube channel. Pitaya are fast growing perennial earthy wine like cacti. The flowers are hermaphroditic, however, some pitaya spices are self incompatible. The fruit is fleshy berry, which is oblong and about 4.5 inches thick with red or yellow peel, with scales and with or without spines. To increase the potential for food production, plant two or three different genetic types. In countries where pitaya are native, selections from the wild are being used. Pitayas grow well in tropical and subtropical climates, mostly free of frosts and freezes. For propagation, usually entire stem segments of 6 to 15 inches are used. Pitaya plants might become quite large and spreading. Fertilize a month after planting or until plants begin to grow. Pitayas have a fairly high water requirement. Harvest only well-colored, mature fruit. Pitayas are fast-growing perennial earthy wine-like cacti. They have a triangular three-sided, sometimes four or five-sided, green, fleshy, jointed, many branches stems. Each stem segment has three flat, wavy wings, ribs with cameos margins, and may have one to three small spines or be spineless. The stem sections of pitaya form aerial roots that adhere to the surface upon which they grow or climb. The stem might reach about 20 feet long. The flowers are hermaphroditic, however some pitaya species are self-incompatible. The extremely showy, edible, white and pink in other species, flowers are very large, very fragrant, nighttime and bell-shaped and might be up to 14 inches long and 9 inches wide. The stamens and lob stigmas are cream-colored. The fruit is fleshy berry, which is oblong and about 4.5 inches thick with red or yellow peel, with scales and with or without spines. The pulp might be white, red or purple, depending on the species. Seeds are very small, numerous and black, embedded with the pulp. To increase the potential for fruit production, plant two or three different genetic types. Cross-pollination between the different types in the planting will assure a better fruit set and size. Flowers open at night when there is no bee activity. Flowers of some cultivators remain open during the early to mid-morning hours and might be visited by bees. Alternatively, hand pollination might be done during the night and early morning hours by collecting pollen or whole stamens from one flower and applying it to the stigma of the other flowers. In countries where pitaya are native, selection from the wild are being used. Many of these have been introduced into countries that are interested in growing them. Unfortunately, information on the self-incompatibility of these cultivators and selection is not well documented. This makes variety recommendations difficult at best and potentially unreliable. Pitayas grow well in tropical and subtropical climates, mostly free of frosts and freezes. They tolerate cool or warm climates, provided temperatures do not exceed 100 degrees Fahrenheit. They tolerate some shade and might be injured by extreme sunlight. They are considered a full sunlight crop in their native countries. Initial estimates from native areas suggest that the optimum temperatures for growth 
are 65 to 77 degree Fahrenheit. Pitaya might be propagated from seed, but fruit and stem characteristics are variable and the time from planting to fruit production might be up to 7 years. Usually entire stem segments of 6 to 15 inches are used. A slanted cut is made at the stem base, then the cuttings are treated with a fungicide and left to cure for 7 to 8 days in a dry, shady location before they are planted directly in the field or in a well-trained media in pots. Cuttings grow very fast and many produce fruit in 6 to 9 months after planting. Longer cuttings usually reach the trellis supports faster than shorter ones. 3 to 4 years old plants might produce about 120 pounds of fruit per year. The life of pitaya planting is estimated to be about 20 years. Pitaya plants might become quite large and spreading, and therefore individual plants should be planted 15 to 25 feet or more away from trees, structures and electrical lines. A strong trellis should be established that might withstand several hundred pounds of stem weight. A weak trellis might buckle under the weight of a mature pitaya plant. Do not use wires on the trellis, because they might cut or damage the stems. If wire is used, it should be covered by plastic hose. For the home landscape, consider a trellis for individual plants, which should consist of a post and a structure at the top of the post to support the plant. types of pruning need to be carried out to obtain maximum production of healthy, good quality fruits. The first one involves training the growing plants until they reach the trellis. This involves eliminating any lateral stems along the main stem until it reaches the trellis and tying the main stem to the trellis past. Soon after plants reach the top of the trellis, their tips should be cut to induce branching and the new laterals trained and tied to the trellis. Wait about a month after planting or until plants begin to grow to start fertilizing. Fertilization in the first year should be frequent with light applications of 0.25 pounds per plant. The addition of 4 pounds of well-decomposed manure or compost around the base of the plant but not touching the stem is recommended during the first year. Apply small amounts of iron sulfate at the base of the plants growing in neutral and low pH soils. Pitayas are members of the cactus family and might withstand dry periods. They have a fairly high water requirement. However, excessive soil moisture will result in development of bacterial and fungus diseases. A dry period is required for abundant bloom induction, but once plants flower, periods of drought may result in poor production. Therefore, periodic watering is recommended for flowering through harvest. Mulching pitaya plants in the home landscape helps retain soil moisture, reduces weed problems next to the plant stem, and improves the soil near the surface. Mulch with a 2 to 6 inch layer of bank, wood chips, or similar mulch material. Keep mulch 8 to 12 inches from the base of the plant stem. Thorny pitayas are more difficult to harvest. 
leather clothes and long sleeved shirts are recommended for harvesting thorny pitoes. Hand clippers should be used to remove fruits from the plants. Be careful not to damage the fruit and remove any stub at the stem attachment by cutting the fruit stem flush to the fruit surface. Harvest only well colored mature fruit. Fruit will keep 4 to 5 days at the room temperature or several weeks in a plastic bags in the refrigerator. Thank you for watching and make sure to subscribe and click on the bell button to be notified on the similar upcoming videos. Plant Farm Eat is a platform for horticulture and environmental enthusiasts, helping you maximize your time and efforts and provide you with pragmatic guides on how to plant, farm and eat sustainably. potato is a tropical warm seasonal crop and a perennial plant originated in the South America. Sweet potatoes are an excellent source of fiber, vitamins, minerals and complex carbohydrates. Sweet potato contains beta-carotene, which is easily converted by the body into vitamin A. Sweet potatoes are broadly divided into two categories, those with moist flush and those with drier flush. Moist flush varieties are often referred to as yams, which are botanically different. Well trained sandy or loamy soils provide the best environment for storage roots to develop. Planting sweet potatoes in heavy clay or rocky soil will result in misshapen sweet potato roots. Soil that does not drain well might result in lower yields and rotten sweet potato roots. Sweet potatoes are fairly tolerant of a wide range of soil but will grow best in soils with pH of 5.5 to 6.5. Sweet potatoes benefits from soil with organic matter. If you add animal manure to the soil, be sure to add it well before planting to allow for decomposition. Sweet potatoes are produced from vegetative stem tip cuttings or slips. Slips are produced from sprouted sweet potato storage roots saved from the previous year's crop. Slips may or may not have roots when they are cut. A good sweet potato slip shall be firm, green and 8 to 12 inches long, preferably with one or two leaves. You can produce slips at home or purchase them from a reputable vendor. To produce slips, buy healthy, disease-free sweet potatoes from a local market. Scrub them clean and then cut them in half. Suspend each half of a jar of water by inserting toothpicks so that half is submerged in the water. Place the sweet potato near a window for a warmth and sunlight. Over the next few weeks, shoots will form on top. Sweet potatoes shall be grown in rich rows 12 inches wide and 8 to 10 inches tall. Plant after soils have warmed and all danger of spring frost has passed. Sweet potato slips can be transplanted from early May through June. Plant slips with a cut 
and down, 4 to 5 inches deep and 9 to 15 inches apart. Rows should be 3 to 4 feet apart. Planting slips farther apart in a row will often result in an earlier harvest or larger sweet potato roots. Eight weeks before you plant slips, place smaller sweet potato roots from the previous year's crop into hotbeds and cover with one to two inches of soil. You can also plant sweet potato roots in raised beds, cover with one to two inches of soil, and cover the entire bed with black or clear plastic mulch. Plastic mulch shall contain a two inch ventilation hole every four linear feet of plant bed. Plant beds should remain between 75 and 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Remove the plastic mulch when shoots begin to emerge from the soil, approximately 2 to 4 weeks after bedding. Slips are ready to cut when the growing point of the shoot extends 9 to 13 inches above the soil surface. Check the soil test results to determine how much nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium is needed. Test results will include recommendations for fertilizer application rates. In the absence of a soil test, apply 5 to 10 to 10 fertilizer. Incorporate prior to rich formation and planting. Sweet potato plants require full sunlight to fully develop. Plants shall receive at least 8 hours of full sun each day. Sweet potato plants are vines, and they trial along the ground. Sweet potatoes are extremely heat tolerant. They can also tolerate light frosts as long as the soil temperature stays above 55 degrees Fahrenheit. In a mixed vegetable garden, avoid planting sweet potatoes near taller vegetable plants with more upright growth habits. Taller plants typically block sunlight from low-growing sweet potato points. If space is limited, plant sweet potatoes on the south or west side of taller plants to allow for more direct sunlight. Sweet potatoes are tough plants and are generally considered to be drought tolerant. However, the best quality and greatest quantity of sweet potato storage roots are produced when plants receive timely and sufficient watering. Plants should be watered immediately after they are transplanted in order to allow roots to form on slips. Maintain even soil moisture during the first two weeks after planting. After plants are established, sweet potatoes should receive approximately 1 inch of rainfall or irrigation per week. The best way to control weeds in the home garden is by shallow hoeing, hand removal and mulch. A layer of mulch 1 to 2 inches thick should suppress most weight and help maintain even soil moisture during the growing season. Unlike most crops, sweet potatoes never truly ripen or reach a stage of maturity. Young sweet potato storage roots are formed within the first two weeks of planting and continue growing larger. Sweet potato varieties differ in days to maturity, but most range between 90 and 120 days. Sweet potatoes should be harvested in the late summer to early fall 
before soil temperatures drop below 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Carefully place a shovel or a garden fork into the ground far enough away from where the wine enters the ground to avoid cutting through the sweet potato storage roots. Use the shovel or fork to lift up each individual hill. Excessive skinning or abrasion will shorten the time roots can be stored and might cause roots to spoil or shrivel. Harvesting sweet potatoes when the soil is dry will result in increased skinning and should be avoided if possible. Cure sweet potatoes immediately after harvest. Place them in an environment with temperatures of 80 to 85 degree Fahrenheit and 85 to 90 percent relative humidity for 7 to 10 days. Curing helps to heal wounds that occur during harvest, preventing shriveling and reducing the risk of rot during storage. Curing also makes the sweet potato more palatable by converting starches to sugars and improving aroma and texture. Under the right conditions, properly cured sweet potatoes can be stored for months. Sweet potatoes should be stored in a dark, cool place. Temperatures should remain between 55 and 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Remember that sweet potatoes have tropical origins, and a raw sweet potato should never be stored in the refrigerator. When stored below 55 degrees Fahrenheit for extended periods of time, roots can experience chilling injury, resulting in hard cores when they are cooked. If roots are stored above 60 degrees Fahrenheit, for extended periods, sprouts might begin to appear from the top of the root. Thank you for watching, and for more on how to grow vegetables, check the playlist. And don't forget to subscribe to be notified on the upcoming videos.